Hello and welcome to a very special episode three of Australian Muscle Car TV. Today we bring you what is considered the most revered of Australian muscle cars, the XY GTHO Phase 3 Ford Falcon. Today's example is a very, very special car in that Australian muscle car sales have been commissioned and have completely restored this car for um, Rod, who will feature and you will meet today. Uh, the car was taken from pretty much uh, a usable, used and tired car and brought to this pristine condition. We'll walk you through the car and you'll get to appreciate pretty much every nut and bolt. Okay, I'd like to welcome Rod to Muscle Hi. Car TV. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting us uh, show your magnificent Phase 3 to, uh, to the Muscle Car TV audience. It's my Thank pleasure, you. Mike. It's my pleasure. It's uh, something I've always wanted all my life, and now that I've got one, I'm happy to share it with as many other people as possible. Oh, well, thank you. Now, Harry mentioned in his introduction that um, this car is the most revered of the Australian muscle cars, and what we want to do uh, between Rod and I is delve into what it is that makes this car so revered. Now, I'm going to ask you, Rod, what is it that makes it so revered to you? Um, without a doubt, the, the, the sound of a GDHO is far above anything else as far as I'm concerned. I've always been a Ford person all my life, and the uh, sound of these cars is just... And they were the ultimate. They were the, one of the fastest four-door sedans in the world for quite a while. Yep. It's taken the rest of the uh, Australian market a long time to catch up with what this car could do. Yeah. Um, after driving this, I think that the uh, V8 supercar drivers have got it very easy these days compared to the guys that used to race these so successfully with what you could buy straight off the showroom. Yeah, unbelievable, isn't yeah, it? Fantastic. But there, there's a car that uh, uh, basically in, the, in these days, you've got to put it in perspective, we were talking about people driving HR Premiers and, and XM XP Falcons and they get into a car that can do 140 miles an hour off the showroom floor. Exactly, you know? yes. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, yes. And actually, Alan Moffat in race trim uh, had this car going down Conrod Strait at 175 miles an hour. So that's uh, actually, pretty mind-boggling. Incredible, yeah. incredible to think that you could, you, I could go in and buy one and, and away you go. Yeah. Probably not as fast as him for sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, but one thing that, that Rod said which was quite interesting was the, the fact that it took until 2001 for the local manufacturers Holden Ford to catch up with the power of this car. This phase three was 385 brake horsepower or 287 kilowatts at the flywheel and it took until 2001 for Ford and Holden to catch up and even then we're talking about a car that weighs over 1,800 kilograms, and this car weighs just a tad over 1,500 yeah. kilograms. Yep. Uh, that fantastic. is incredible. Yeah, fantastic. They were, they were sort of ahead of their time. Yeah. Um, I think in 71 at Bathurst, uh, out of the first six spots, there was five yes. GDHOs. So. That's right. And I had the pleasure of being there at that day. So <laughs> oh, fantastic. That was, yeah, that was fantastic. It really was, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, now, the, the other thing that makes this car so revered is the fact that it is very limited in the number, and there are what? How yeah, many that's, that yeah. Built? There's only, only uh, 300, I think. 300, 300 built, built. Uh, of, of the ultra white. There was 30, no. uh, 39. Yeah, and we believe there's about 15 of these left. So this is a very rare car at the moment, yeah. um, and probably getting rarer. Yeah. The other aspect of um, why is this car so amazing and so well re regarded by Australian motorists, motor enthusiasts? is the racing prowess. Now, maybe let's have a bit of a chat about that. First of all, what was um, Moffat? Moffat blew himself away in this car. And what... what yeah, well, he, I believe he broke the, his own lap record by 13-odd seconds, yeah. uh, which, you know, is a phenomenal uh, yeah. achievement. 13 seconds, it doesn't sound like much, but on a racetrack, that's, oh. that's a huge distance. Well, you're talking... Um, he did 2.39, just let me refer to my notes, 2, 30, two minutes, 38.9 seconds. So he took 13 seconds off his, his own lap record yeah. with this car. Yeah. 
yeah, so exactly. he was just gobsmacked with the with the the power and the handling. Now the interesting thing is that there's there's often been debate about what does HO stand for? Does it stand for high output? Does it stand for handling option? And in effect, with this car, Ford really did do both. Yeah. They made a car that really goes and they made a car that really handles well. Why did this car go so well? And it was quite a, um, a modified car compared to the standard XY GT. And that's how they, they the a standard XY GT was uh, generating about 300 brake horsepower, the flywheel. These cars were generating about 385. And Rod, uh, you've had this dynoed, and what's this uh, generating? This, this dynoed at 415. At the flywheel. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah that was on the, on the engine dyno. Wow. So, yeah, fantastic. That's... So this is even more powerful than a, than what they were back in uh, 1971. But to give you an idea of what they did, uh, is um, quite interesting because of the of the. Uh, first of all, you wanted to get a lot more fuel into the into uh, the engine so that the carburetor on these as opposed to a, an XYGT being a 600 CFM uh, carburetor, these are actually a 780 CFM Holly. So pumping a lot more fuel in. Uh, you've got a, a much lumpier cam in these cars. Um, and because of that, we had to have a vacuum tank, which is, um, you can see these tubes going through here and then into the um, the uh, brake booster um, in order to, to get uh, uh, stopping power. You had to have the vacuum tank because of the cam. And then if you come around this side, um, you'll see that there's a, a rev limiter on the wall, an auto light rev limiter. That, that is the original rev limiter that came with this car. And that, that rev limiter li limits the uh, engine revs to 6150. So, um, you won't blow up the engine, which is, uh, it's very, you know, this thing, when you, dr when you drive it, you can see it just revs absolute freely, unbelievable power in these cars. Um, in addition to those modifications, you had HM headers. So instead of a, a standard exhaust manifold, you had extractors and they were um, HM headers. You had a much bigger alternator, uh, which is here. Um, obviously, the uh, the engine instead of being a hydraulic engine was a solid had solid lifters, so a lot noisier, a lot um, a lot more responsive, a lot more power. They had a, a three core radiator to be able to cool, uh, cool them down a lot quicker. Um, they had a baffled sump, um, a very big uh, three inch tail shaft. Uh, much bigger than a standard GT's tail shaft. Uh, they had a rear sway bar which carried over from the, uh, the phase two and the phase one. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say there is in this car, it is basically um, built to go and built to handle. So whether high output or handling option, that's what Ford racing really was all about. And the, the wonderful thing about this car, which has never been, can't be replicated, is the fact that this car could have been bought by um, a privateer or by uh, Ford Racing, driven to Bathurst with number plates, and then basically raced, had the whole day, came fifth or fourth or second or first or whatever, and then um, driven home and put into the garage of the privateer. And that, that is the, the, the uh, wonderful mystique of these cars. The other thing that's um, uh, obviously very spellbinding about the Phase 3 GDHO is the fact that it really is a barometer for the Australian muscle car market as far as values go. It is the most expensive Australian muscle car that you can buy. Um, and it always has been. Um, very interesting, when they were first new, you could walk into your Ford dealership and buy one of these for $5,250 in 1971. This was between May and November 1971, which is when they were manufactured. By 1977, they had gone to about $12,000, so they'd more than doubled in value 
in that first um, six years. And then they steadily uh, grew in value. By about the early 80s, they were worth about 50. By the late 80s, they were worth about 100 grand. And uh, during the, the Keating uh, recession that we all had to have, the values came down to about 50 grand again. And then very progressively and steadily, the values grew. And I remember at the GT Nationals in 2003, they were back up to about uh, 100, 110 grand for a phase three. And then they really took off in value. Uh, basically, by 2006, we sold uh, a black phase three with a sunroof and set a new record at that time at 400. And then they very quickly grew in value to 2007, which was the peak where they hit uh, well into the sevens with uh, a number of cars, one car going to auction and selling for 683, an Australian muscle car selling uh, a yellow ochre phase three which is up in the loft up there for 700 and a, a Monza green phase three for 750. Uh, as we all know 2008 uh, was the, um, the end of the boom and uh, the prices have fallen back to somewhere between 350 and 600,000 depending on the car, the options, the colour and uh, its credentials. So what makes a Phase 3 even more valuable? And the answer to that is obviously the fact that there are not very many that remain, but uh, the other thing is the fact that uh, it has to have uh, a good colour combination. So, you know, vermilion fires, wild violets, um, uh, yellow glow, um, ultra white, you know, a good colour combination with black trim or black trim with cloth insert. Even um, uh, Ford did this uh, wild Hawaiian trim, which um, we've seen a few of in the past. We had a black, black trim phase three with a uh, like a purple Hawaiian trim and we've also got a XY GT here with a saddle trim with the Hawaiian trim as well. So rare options uh, like the trim, rare options like a factory Wineback gold sunroof, uh, a very sought after option in those days that a lot of phase three owners ticked was an eight track stereo uh, where you had the big cartridge and you could play the Seekers or uh, Bob Dylan or any of those guys and enjoy that as you were cruising in your phase three. Although I don't think Rod would have. Rod would just have the radio <laughs> off and listening to the exhaust. The exhaust. Exactly. But, uh, um, so a colour combination and the fact of options. The other thing is that if you notice here, there's a QC stamp. And that was actually, um, uh, again, something that you could pay additional money for to get Ford to hand build your motor so that it is bulletproof. And basically all the race teams ordered that. And the thing about this car, being a fifth month uh, 1971 car, this was the beginning of the phase threes. And these cars, I'll let Harry talk about the mechanical specs, but these cars are basically as close to the race car as you can get uh, with their 31 spline and the long shaft and other various things that Harry will talk about. But the other thing that, that um, we should maybe mention, Rod, is about what makes this also the most uh, revered car is the fact what? That yeah, the fact that um, out of all the cars that are replicated, this is the one car that everybody wants to, uh, to try and come up to. But, yeah. um, I mean, you can't. You've got to have a GDHO phase three. That's you can replicate as best as you like, but they'll yeah. never be the same as thing. this car. There's, there's nothing like the real thing. That's it. Yep, absolutely. So we've uh, talked to um, the mechanical bits that make this car a special car. You've got your GT derivatives, which we've covered off. The GDHO derivative of the XY basically a purpose-built race car. It was a car that was built and produced from factory and sold to its owners, not dissimilar to the car that raced on the Sunday. 
So it might cover off things like, you know, the solid lifters, the bigger carburetor, the bigger um, radiator, and all the bits that make this, you know, a more heavy-duty, purpose-built uh, engine, if you like. But coupled to that were things like um, the uh, the top-loader gearbox. Now, you know, these cars were treated with the long shaft gearbox, which changed the ratios, made them more of a touring car, a cruiser, really built for the long stretches. Uh, you know, Conrad Strait comes to mind, and of course the car was purpose-built to conquer the mountain back in the day. And then you've got the 9-inch diff, which was also treated to, you know, um, special what, 31 spline axles. Not all of them were treated with the 31 uh, spline axles. Some did get the 28 spline, which is a standard type uh, axle, but the heavier duty axle, which came in along with the duty HO, was the, um, the 31 spline. So when we sort of um, took to uh, restoring Rod's car, we really made it a point to, um, to get all the bits right because the sum total of the, the GTHO makes it special. Uh, you've got to have the right bits. You've got a vehicle that was purpose built for racing, you've got a vehicle that was equipped with racing components. So to take that away from the car would detract from its value. It's all very well to have the, uh, the tag displayed as, as uh, Rod has here very proudly. You know, we've taken off the car for uh, security sake. But at the end of the day, the tag is a number. Um, and then the whole package, the car holistically and its value has all about the components. So we talked about the various diff ratios that the cars um, were offered with, you know. You had uh, the drag type diff ratios and you had the more touring type ratios. Um, three to one, for example, three and a half to one, and then you could get 3.9 to one diff ratios, which made it a very, very tall order. So for those guys that like to sit at the lights on Parramatta Road and get off uh, quickly to beat the, uh, you know, the GDS Monaros, that was the, the option they would have gone for. But generally speaking, um, the 3 0 ratios is what they used out on the mountain because it gave you that nice stretch. That coupled with the uh, long shaft gearbox, as we say, the, uh, the, the long uh, ratio gearbox, uh, made it a real, real mountain eater. So a great car. The rear sway bar is another thing um, that is unique to the GDHO. So factory rear sway bar, apart from the fact that you had you know, the, the heavy duty engine and we talked to its components, you had the, the, the special ratio gearbox, you had the, the beefed up nine inch diff with the 31 spine axles. You had to consider braking and you had to consider stability of the car. And stability is all about the sway bar that was standard with these cars. The, the, the larger diameter rear uh, drums that were um, part of the braking package, all unique to the GDHO. So, as we see, GDHO externally um, has a couple of differences. To the very keen eye, the spoiler, which was unique, the rear spoiler, which was unique to the GDHO. You had the GDHO uh, you know, logo or badge, if you like, or sticker on the glove box, unique to it. Other than that, apart from you know, some bits and pieces, the front spoiler, of course, the bib spoiler, and often um, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the wheels, which were the, uh, the globe type wheels, you really couldn't tell the difference between a standard GT and a GDHO. But mechanically, internally, um, component wise, over 100 differences between the standard XY and the GDHO Phase 3. As we've mentioned many a time over, the most revered of classics for the simple reason that they were built from the factory as a race car. They made 300 to homologate the series before they went out onto the racetrack and they were basically bulletproof. Really, really unbreakable. And as Mike mentioned earlier, when you consider the likes of HR Holdens and the Ford Anglias and the very, very rudimentary cars that were driven back in the late 60s and early 70s and then all of a sudden in 1971 this monster comes onto the scene, it's no wonder they're worth what they're worth today and they are such sought after classics. Okay, so we spoke of um, some components and bits and pieces and features that are unique or, or were unique during the, um, the build of the GDHO Phase 3. In about the second year um, after production, or the first year after production, they wanted to homologate uh, a special race type wheel. Remembering that these cars in standard form came out with uh, what we call the classic five slot steel wheel. So in order to homologate the purpose built Globe Bathurst rim, which was a lighter uh, alloy rim making it you know, uh, a better option, uh, a more strengthened option than the steel wheel and of course a larger diameter which gave it uh, a bit of oomph. Needless to say the look is a much better look uh, in my opinion. What they had to do was take all of the then uh, registered owners of the GDHO Phase 3 and send them a set of these wheels and that's exactly what Ford Motor Company did. So in order to homologate the wheel for the 1972 race, they took the physical wheel by four sent them out to the owners, and then that way, of course, 
the, um, they, they complied with the ruling. So the wheel, unique to the GDHO. Of course, these days the wheel is used on many a model, but in the day, unique to the uh, GDHO uh, phase Another three. thing too with those wheels, it helped with the brake cooling yep. as well. That was a problem they had with the GDHOs early, that they, the brakes would fade as the race went on because they yep. were getting too hot. And that, yep. That wheel definitely helped in the, Fair call. in the cooling. The, yeah, the bigger space, the yeah. diameter wheel. And they look great, don't they? Oh, oh, yeah. I love them. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the high poly sort of rim and then coupled with the red wall tyre, they just look exactly. fantastic. Yeah. There's nothing yep. like them. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so of course you have the gearbox which we spoke about, you know, the, the long shaft gearbox, you have the, the beefed up uh, differential, I mean, short of getting under the car and showing you, you know, we will, uh, um, all, um, all good GDHO enthusiasts will have an opportunity at some stage to sort of have a look at, and then you've got the, beef, the beefier brakes at the back there with the larger, um, the larger uh, drums. Uh, another um, feature which was... Um, introduced in the XW range of GDHOs was the larger range fuel tank. The idea of that, of course, was you know you were out racing, you needed more fuel, go the distance, etc., etc. By the time XYs came around, um, they decided that during in the standard range of GTs they wouldn't offer um, in the XY the large tank as a as an option because what they found was people were buying the XW GTs. They were getting these standard. Uh, they were getting these standard large tanks, and of course they had nowhere to put their luggage. So in the XY range of GTs, um, the smaller tank with the spare wheel inside embedded into the tank was offered. If you wanted a larger tank on an XY, you had to order as an option. On the Phase 3, of course, um, you know, it came as a standard. Being a homologation special, being a car that was literally, um, you know, as we say, uh, purchased on the Friday, then raced in the same form pretty much on a Sunday, um, you had to have the tank as part of as part of the initial build, uh, and it sits underneath this beautiful um, this beautiful old uh, vinyl floor uh, boot mat, which is the original. And uh, with the restoration of this particular vehicle, the bits that were um, the bits that were uh, in excellent original order, we sort of uh, tried to maintain with the vehicle, or have kept with the vehicle, including the very beautiful trim. This particular car has all of its original trim, and to the connoisseur, that is a, a far better option than. Uh, buying brand new seat covers. People prefer the original trims and if they're in, in as good a condition as these particular ones were, which were pretty much in brand new condition, then of course you're going to use them uh, as, the, as, as opposed to the, uh, to the newer option. Um, so, um, yeah, so what about that, Rod? Buy on a Friday and race on a Sunday. Uh, I actually was had the pleasure of being at a, a gentleman from Sydney, a well-known Speedway identity, and also I found out yesterday he raced... Um, on the black as well, right. uh, Barry Graham, he raced quite a few times at Bathurst, yeah, yeah. and he said in his early days he had an ultra white, well, and he used to drive it to the racetrack, his wife would yeah, follow with the kids yeah. in a station wagon with a spare set of the race tyres on, yeah. they'd swap them over at the racetrack, he would race, come back, put the that's road tyres on and drive the car home. So he said it made him a better driver because he knew if he yeah, bent it, yeah, he couldn't yeah. take it home. So <laughs> uh, he used to make sure he looked after it. Very good. Yeah. That's awesome. A good friend of ours here at, uh, here at Muscle Cars is a fellow by the name of uh, Bob Skelton. Um, Bob often visits and, and uh, pops his head in from time to time and, and I could sit here and listen to him for hours on end, you know, telling us stories about the GDHOs in the days. He actually ran second to Moffat uh, in the big race when, yeah. uh, when Moffat took it out. Bob Skelton yep. was, was in second place. And, he would tell me that uh, literally in all of the in all the models that he drove over the years, and you know he had uh, a go with the uh, Tiranas and whatnot, and the earlier Monaros. They would often buy these cars during the week. They would register, drive yep. them to the track, remove exhaust, and make the minor modifications that they could according to the rules. And off they'd go. They'd be racing them on Sunday. So yeah. pretty awesome. Incredible when you mm. you know when you think about it, and to get one in this condition uh, is I, I'm just very very yeah. pleased. Well, I mean the fortunate thing for yourself and certainly for this car and for all of us I suppose because it's another one that has survived. They only made 300, they reckon there's probably about 110 left, uh, is the fact that this particular car when we started pulling it down um, to restore it was such a good car to start with. All of its original panels, the floors were intact, the radiator support had never been tapped. So when you start with a good canvas if you like, yep. <laughs> to yeah. use the analogy, you're yeah. always going to end up with a work of yeah. art and that's what really it has become. I, I, you know, we, we often uh, sit back and are in awe of this car. It has really come up a, a bit of a treat. So congratulations to you and well done. I, what I would like appreciate to say, many years of it. Thank you, Harry, and, and thanks to Australian Muscle yeah. Car for all the work you guys have done. You've done a fantastic job. I'd recommend you to anybody. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to taking this car back to Perth and showing it to all my Wonderful. friends over there. Many years of enjoyment. All the best to you. Thank right. you. Cheers.
basically uh, we're now out on the Heathcote Road with Rod uh, in, uh, in uh, his uh, Phase 3 GDHO. This is one of the, um, the earlier Phase 3s uh, that were built in July of 1971. And because of that, it is um, uh, pretty much uh, a race spec car. In, in other words, it's got a long shaft top loader gearbox as, it, as the race cars had. It's got a uh, 31 spline uh, diff, 9 inch uh, diff in it, um, which is the same as the race cars. So it's, uh, it's very much um, a full on street registrable race car. And that's the, the mystique of these cars, I think. Would you agree, Rod, is that you basically could go into a car showroom in those days buy this car and take it straight out there and race it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's, um, I was talking to a good friend yesterday uh, who had one, and that's exactly how he used to go to the racetrack. His wife would follow in their family car with a set of tyres in it. He would change the wheels at the racetrack, race it, put the other uh, road tyres back on and drive it home. Yeah, it's, it's so, amazing. Yeah, they're, they're, there's not too many cars. I mean, you couldn't do it these days. Well, you, you know, that's the thing. The beauty of the of the, the, the whole uh, uh, mystique of these cars is that nowadays there's very little that uh, is common with a Ford or a Holden that you buy to the race car, whereas in those days basically it was exactly the way it was, maybe with a harness, um, a maybe cage. a roll cage, yeah. different, yeah. maybe a bit different tyres. That, uh, that would be the only difference, yeah. yeah. Um, now, to and give you an idea on the, the power of this car, this is a, a 4V351 motor. They were, Ford never uh, advertised this at the time. They were supposedly 300 brake horsepower, the same as a, a phase, uh, a normal XY GT, but in effect, Rod, they were 385 brake horsepower, or in today's lingo, 287 kilowatts, or 515 newton metres of torque. Yeah. So very very powerful car. So um, what, what's uh, what's your history uh, on uh, on these Australian muscle cars, Rod? Um, well, I've been a Ford person all my life. Uh, I started out. My first car I used to tell people was a 1948 Ford convertible, but it was actually an Anglia Tourer. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, and I've always owned Fords. I've only ever owned one car that wasn't a Ford, and and of course. If you, I love all my uh, motor racing. Um, naturally, this is the car you led to because of their, their history, and um, they were just far supreme to everything else as far as I was concerned in, in the Ford uh, range. So, when you were uh, in 1971, were you actually um, uh, following the races and going to Bathurst's and going to the racetracks? Yeah, I was at Bathurst uh, the year Moffat won in, in the Judy H.O. Uh, I came back again. When Alan Moffat and um, Colin Bond run one and two in the in the two doors, yeah, yeah, um, and I came back again. Unfortunately, the next time when Rocky won by two laps in a Commodore, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but yeah, and I, I'll, uh, so yeah, I've followed them. I just love my V8s. I love them. Still love them today. And what's the? Um, you, you were also telling me that you used to work at a Ford dealer. Yeah, I worked for Thompson Ford in Parramatta. Uh, where I was in the pre-delivery and I had the pleasure of driving two GDHOs in that time uh, and that once once you've driven one well it's all over there's no contest and um, so had you driven one back then when you were pre-delivering them you'd taken them for a bit of a fang yeah we used to do test drive there was a there was a street in the back of Parramatta that it was a fairly long concrete road that had no crossroads on it so we used to be able to give them a bit of a touch up down there. <laughs> um, I remember I was, I think I, I went and picked a, we were living in, in Granville and I went home and picked up a mate that was with us and we were doing 80 mile an hour in second gear down this street. He could not believe it. Oh, fantastic. And, and what is it that excites you about the phase three? You know, like the, the thing that is the most unusual thing about this car and the only Ford that's ever had the shaker sticking out through the bonnet. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that's probably the, the most obvious thing. Yeah. You can drive along and see that moving as you're getting into it and uh, and, and the, the note and that of the car, and it's just so nice to drive. Yeah. It's like the, um, 
uh, you know, you, you're actually seeing the engine alive, aren't you? Yeah, because that's you, it. You're yeah, actually you see it responding to the accelerator. You know, as you as you start to stand into it, you can see it start to. It's all starting to happen. Yeah. And uh, have you been looking for a phase three for a while? Um, I mean, <laughs> all my life I've been looking for one, but it's only in the last couple of years that I was in the position to buy one. So uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, I didn't look for long when I when we came across this one. So yeah, I, I got onto the internet and uh, came up with your website and went from there. And were, were you um, were you looking for a particular colour or? Or it didn't really matter. No, it didn't matter. No, I, I didn't care what it was as long as it was a Phase Three Jetty HO. That was exactly what I wanted. And uh, as soon as there was one available, we were into it. Yeah. And what what um, what do you know of the history of this particular car? Uh, apparently, it's got a fairly checkered career. Um, it was uh, in Western Australia when a fugitive escaped and borrowed it and drove it right across apparently got as far as Aubrey Wodonga before he was caught um, which is testament to the car I suppose or he might have been a good driver <laughs> I don't know um, but yeah and then uh, apparently the, one of the policemen at the place where they impounded it ended up buying it and it's changed owners a few times since then and then uh, now I've been lucky enough to get it yeah that's fantastic and what, what are your plans uh, for the car uh, well, it'll, it'll come back to Perth um, I'm from Western Australia, so it'll come back to Perth with me. And uh, I sort of haven't made any... Uh, I, I would like to show it, I think, because of the fact that it's in such great condition. Um, and it'll get driven very rarely. Um, I'll probably tilt try it to shows and that. So uh, mainly I've got a 20-year-old son, and I think that uh, he'll gain more benefit out of it than I will in, in later years. Does he enjoy the cars as well? He can't wait for this car to get back to Perth. He's oh. been driving me nuts about it. So, yeah, he's uh, he's really excited about it. I've got, yeah. got the two Mustangs at home, and when they have to go down to the car wash, he's the first one out the door. <laughs> get out the door and yeah. drive. Yeah. And are they, are they a supercharged 5.4? Uh, the, the, the 207 Shelby is, yeah. That's... that's only a downside of that, it's an automatic. So uh, uh, the, the 201 Cobra I've got's got the five-speed manual in it. And what's the uh, what's this like as far as um, to drive? Because basically, what we wanted to to um, show people who uh, watch our our video, Muscle Car TV, um, what is it like to drive one of these cars? Like as far as the clutch and the gearbox and um, steering. Surprisingly light for a car that you could race uh, the steering is, is brilliant I mean it's it's all been rebuilt I mean this car is brand new it is back to exactly how it would have come off the showroom floor so but it is still even um, better than that I think it's it's the steer Ford have always been good with the steering but this is this is just so easy it's a little hard um, to drive them slow you can't because they're, they're, they're designed to go fast and you've got to sort of sit in the gears a bit but you can't um, uh, let it creep along because it just doesn't like it. But uh, yeah, clutch and, and, and everything brakes, beautiful. Yeah, well, the Phase 3 had the um, uh, Kelsey Hayes uh, front discs and then they had um, uh, vented, uh, vented discs on the uh, vented drums on the rear, which are different than the standard XYGT. So um, they probably. I know, I remember hearing once that Alan Moffat said that I think. I think it was Gagan came to drive with him and Moffat had already been out in practice and came back into the pits and Gagan got in it, did two laps and pulled in and said there's something wrong with the brakes. And Alan Moffat thought, oh no. So he got in it and away he went and came back in. He said, there's nothing wrong with them. And Gagan said, well, it won't stop. And he said, well, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> After they get hot, there's, uh, you just got to drive them. So, yeah. And what do you think of this? This is uh, quite oh, a funny... Uh, yeah, it's uh, only, they only put these on Phase 3s back in uh, the day. Yeah. Do not lower windows at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. So we're, we're hoping we don't get sucked out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the window. Yeah, that's, that's, that sticker on the glove box is the one that 
does it for me. I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the thing that the turns you on. The only thing on the car that tells you that it's a HO, except for the fact that when you drive it, you know it is. But Yeah, yeah they sound... Uh, the sound of these cars is so different than a standard GT because of the uh, solid lifters. Um, it's just such a much more noisy experience, the whole, uh, uh, from an engine point of view. Well, Chris from uh, Australian Muscle Car said when they dynoed this engine, mm -hmm. uh, it was producing 415 brake horsepower and that's about the best, well he said it's the best they've ever had out of one of these motors. So. Mm -hmm. um, Normally they're around the 380, 385 mark. So, um, so this is even more powerful and, than it would have been in the day. Let's put it in third and give it a bit of a. That gives you an idea of just the the potent power of a phase three. And that wasn't really... Um, Nothing, but no. You're just touching it. Let's have a look under the car now. With this particular car, as we say, that's, uh, this is Rod's car, this is the restored car. Let's have a look at what's going on under there. We'll uh, point out a few um, little things that are unique to the Phase 3s as well as... Um, uh, show off a little bit of the work that's been done. Let's have a look. Okay, so when you take a bit of a, an overall view, you can see it's all brand new, as is the car on top. We've sort of restored and gone from bare bones. We've, when we're sorting the cars, we, we try and um, emulate what they did in the factory. When they restored them many years ago, people would proof coat the underbelly of the cars and they'd you know, hit them with black paint or what have you. In fact, when these cars left the factory, they often had the overspray. So when you have a look here under the, 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 the shell of this car, we try and replicate the overspray. So as they went down the production line, you know, quality control in 1971 on the Ford factory was not the best in the world. So often they'd get overspray, and when you sort of go to concourse um, and situations or you, you restore cars these days and we do them to a standard, we try and replicate everything as per factory spec, even the overspray, would you believe? It's a bit of an extreme thing, but believe me, the judges in these uh, situations have a look at them. There are the headers. We talked about the exhaust, or I don't know if we did talk about the exhaust, but unique to um, to the Phase 3. And uh, you see them here coupled with uh, with the setup here. The tail shaft here, larger tail shaft, you know, heavier duty, um, unique to the Phase 3. The 9-inch diff, of course. I spoke earlier of the sway bar. Now, the sway bar was something, apart from the engine gearbox and, of course, the running gear, which was made bulletproof, Essentially, these cars started life, or the, the, the base car started life, as a family sedan. So, you know, when you take a family sedan and you put the bulletproof, you know, hot running gear in them and you send them off to the racetrack, you've got to try and do something about the handling. They were never really built to go around corners. So, in an effort to do so, Ford incorporated this sway bar, um, which you see as part of the standard fitting here to the... Um, to the GDHO. There's that long range fuel tank we spoke about. That's a that's a, uh, a brand new tank there, sender unit. We've kept the original clips and rubbers and really gone to some trouble when restoring this particular vehicle. We've kept the uh, original style shock absorbers. Um, when you look at the um, the hangers here, which are unique to the to the dual exhaust cars, they're all standard and intact here for the for the GDHO. Um, you look under the car and the one thing that tends to strike people uh, and, and people that don't necessarily know too much about these things have a look at all these little paint dabs and they say well what's the story with all these all these color coatings here why why is this thing green and the other one's red and why has the why has the shifter you know got got all these sort of color dabs on them why the gearbox bolts got colors on them a couple of things firstly color coding was to ensure that when these things went down the production line the right bit was used in the right car so if this car had a build sheet on it that was designated GDHO, you had to make sure you had that colour code tail shaft on it. And the diff had to look like that, for example. So everything was colour coded. Now, a lot of what you see, these red dabs, and sorry to swing from one side to the other here, mate, I don't want to make it too difficult. These are what we call inspection colour dabs. So the idea was, went through the process, car was built, the inspector had a look at them and said, yep, that's locked up, that's intact, bang, I'll, uh, I'll paint that. I'll give that the OK. So think of it as an OK stamp as per the engine, which was tested. 
um, when they went over and they had a look at the suspension components, they had a look at the ball joints, they had a look at all the bolts here that kept this thing together. They wanted to ensure that it hit the road in a safe um, form. That's what they did. So before the car was ticked off for uh, release from the factory, had to have all the inspection marks on it. So we'll have a look at this top loader. We spoke about the heavy duty top loader. There it is there. Um, there's your, there's your, this particular sump is, uh, is the wing type sump. If you have a look under here, I don't know if you can get under there, but you've got the heavy duty uh, harmonic balancer, which was, a, which was another feature of the, the GDHR. We've got that, that heavy duty um, alternator, the bigger, bigger core radiator. It all goes to, it all goes to making uh, the GDH HO a race car as, um, you know, um, as far away from the, from, from the, uh, the family, uh, the family sedan as you could get, if you like. Over here, we spoke about earlier, I'll just pop around here and have a look at these larger brakes. Now, if you had a look at a standard type rear brake system, you'd see a lot smaller unit. These rear fin brakes were built in such a way as to um, help with air cooling, uh, help with, uh, help with strengthening, and obviously more of a surface area for braking. Um, so that's the whole idea of the, the larger fin brakes. So a myriad of differences, as I say, over a hundred differences between the um, between the standard uh, XYGT and the GDHO. Um, we've gone through and had a look at a few of them. We hope you've appreciated it. We hope you've uh, enjoyed having a look at Rod's car. Uh, Rod is looking forward to many, many years of motoring, which what is essentially a brand new car, and I dare say this particular car will certainly outstrip uh, and outlast my lifetime. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next episode. Thank you